So what is SEO and how do I dominate at it, at it? Well, search engine optimization is the art and science of optimizing web documents for both humans and for search engines. Now, this is where I think a lot of people get it wrong. Uh, historically, many people have done SEO solely for search engines. So this would be Google uh, for most people. And what they do is they'll read all the latest patents that come out and they'll follow the latest blogs and they'll, they'll be on Twitter and new apps like Periscope and all of these things, trying to figure out what are the new algorithms that uh, Google and the other search engines are coming out with. And they'll write web pages just for that. And while this certainly does work in the short term, it very much so does not work in the long term. In fact, we've seen a lot of that this last um, two years with big algorithm updates called Penguin and Panda that came out uh, and really ruined a whole lot of websites for people who had just been optimizing content for search engines. So for the people who do it right, and I'm proud to say that this is something that we put a whole lot of effort to at DI, Dealer Inspire, is that we optimize web documents for both humans and for, um, for search engines. So people, I mean, that is what's important here. Uh, you want to back up a few slides yeah, there? Sorry. Sure. No worries. Shani's so excited that uh, she's <laughs> way ahead of us. The second part of this is that SEO is ever-changing and, frankly, extremely complicated. Uh, the more I learn about SEO, and I've been doing this now for six, seven years, uh, however, you, <laughs> however you want to look at it, uh, the more I learn about SEO, the more complicated I realize it is and the more that I realize that there is to learn about it. So this is something that just never gets easier. It's something that is continually getting changing and continually getting more and more complicated as the algorithms and the people uh, who are writing algorithms find new ways to measure things online. But uh, luckily we have found ways <laughs> of, of working with these and working with those people so that we can, we can help, uh, help people rank well in search engines. So let's get into the main question of the day. How does one succeed at SEO? Well, I've come up with a whole bunch of best practices this one. We'll start with the one that is the very most important. This is if you get only one thing from this entire webinar, please let it be this. Uh, this is also the most broad, and we'll go into more specifics after this one. But the very most important thing to know about succeeding at SEO and, frankly, digital marketing in general. So this applies for social media. This applies for email. This applies for PPC. This applies for all of it, is to create wonderful and attractive websites for every device and human. Now, I'm going to read that twice because it's so important. Create wonderful and attractive websites for every device and human. Man, that is a hard, hard thing to do. Uh, now, let's start off with just one of the problems. Uh, wonderful and attractive are both very subjective. Those mean different things to different people. To further complicate how difficult this is, uh, you have every device. Well, it turns out that new devices come out all the time. So people are very familiar, I think, with desktop computers, laptops, with tablets now, and with, with mobiles. Uh, but as we know, things are going to be coming out very shortly, like an uh, Apple Watch and like uh, clothing that can that it will tie into your computer system so that it will react and it will present information to you. Uh, we have Magic Leap, which is a company that's focusing on shining beams of light directly into your retina so that you, it uh, superimposes things in the real world in front of you. So when you look at a blank wall, you'll see a picture of the Mona Lisa that will look as real as if the Mona Lisa was there. These devices are coming out all the time. Uh, and these, as SEOs and as marketers in general, and as people trying to sell cars, these are the uh, the, play, the playing field we are, and the things that we're trying to accomplish. So, how do we do this? Uh, how do we start tackling something that's so broad and so difficult? Well, we have to start with some of the basics. Uh, a lot of times, when you're trying to get into the advanced, you got to start with what's at the bottom. So, the first thing is knowing a few truths. Uh, the first one, I bet you, you already know. Internet users are impatient. Right now, all of you are watching this webinar, and I bet you you have other windows open. There's a cat sitting next to you. There's all these things on the wall. There's someone that might be talking behind you. You're impatient. And in order to, uh, to do anything successfully with you, I need to earn your attention. So hopefully we're about eh, five, ten minutes into this webinar. If you're still here, I've succeeded thus far at earning your attention. But this is something that is going, I'm going to need to continue to do uh, throughout the, the rest of the webinar, and, and you're going to need to continue to do as a marketer and as someone who's trying to sell auto, uh, auto. The next thing is to you need to respond to an ever-growing number of devices. Now, we talked about the main three already, and quite frankly, I've already made this point, so I'm not going to reiterate it, but you need to start with at least the main three, which are tablet, mobile, and desktop. You need to have websites that work on all those devices, but then you need to look forward, and you need to be prepared for what's about to come. Uh, which is going to be a whole bunch more new devices that look very different than, uh, than what we're using today. And the last broad here, and again, I'm starting broad and I'll go more specific. The last broad point here is innovate on content, not on navigation and layout. So content is the most important thing on the Internet. That's why people go to it. Remember, the Internet is used 
by humans. That's what we care about here at the end of the day, is human beings, not the computers that are just being used as different tools. Humans are looking for new content. They want it to be exposed in different ways, be it live streaming with new apps that, that come out, or be it uh, old technologies like, um, like type and like postal mail and all these other things. Uh, so navigate on the or innovate on the content, but not on the navigation and layout. Now, what I mean by this is coming to building websites that people have to relearn how to use every time they go to it. There's absolutely nothing wrong with making tweaks to layouts and, and experimenting with that, but do not build something that someone has does not that someone has to completely relearn how to use the internet when they show up to your website. Uh, there's been a whole lot of big brands who get too excited with innovation uh, and go too far with this and make websites that are completely unusable for people. Uh, the early version of uh, Victoria's Secrets website did this, an early version of BMW's website did this. Uh, there's a whole lot of websites in the art community that unfortunately do this. Uh, innovate on the content itself, that's where I think your priority should lie, rather than the navigation and the layout of, it, of the website. Okay, so at this point I want to pause for just a moment, and if anyone has any questions, uh, now would be a great time to put them in the chat window. Uh, I'm going to give everyone just, just a second to do that. Uh, but I will continue here starting now. All right, number two, continually produce new share-worthy content. Now, we are in a new world with digital marketing. SEO is still extremely effective, and it is by far driving the, um, the most free traffic of any channel that we have access to. Um, but it is slowly, and I want to I wanna reiterate that, it's slowly losing ground to social media. So while 70% of the free traffic that I get to the websites that I've been looking at is coming from SEO, specifically from Google, although the percentage is a little lower from Google compared to some, some other search engines over time. Uh, we are slowly starting to see social, riot, social media rise, and I don't know when we'll get to the, to the tipping point, but it looks like a trend that may happen. Um, so, continually produce new share-worthy content. Now, what does this mean exactly? Well, I think this is a point that a lot of people forget. Each individual page on your website costs you money. You had to pay designers to make all of those graphics. You had to pay copywriters to create that content. You had to pay developers to create all the infrastructure underneath. It's abstracted, but if you think about it, each page on your website costs you some amount of money, something that could be calculated, certainly. So what you need to focus on is making sure that every URL on your website pays its own rent. Uh, that you need to make sure that all of the content is serving some kind of purpose. And this, this is easier said than done. Uh, the way computers work is they produce uh, sloppy websites, unfortunately. Websites where uh, pagination is needed or duplication is present or where um, things just don't quite make sense for humans because they were, they were built by computers for computers. So we need to be diligent about and what you need to pay a whole lot of attention to is making sure that every URL is paying its own rent. Now what do I mean by that? How do you measure that? Uh, how, do you, how do you grade this? Well. You need to make sure that all content needs to be share, either shareable on social media or a great result for some kind of search query. And luckily, this is what makes this possible, is the second part of this, is making sure that each URL on your web page, not just your home page, because that's, that's an obvious one, and not just your BDPs, because those are also obvious ones, but everything else in between, they need to be a great result for some kind of search result. And if they're not there, then they're wasting space and they're potentially wasting money. So be, be aware of that. All right, let's go to number three. Number three, optimize information hierarchy. All right, this is uh, one of my great nerd phrases that me and my friends always use that no one knows what the heck we're talking about. Information hierarchy, what is that? What are you talking about? Information hierarchy is just the complicated way of, of discussing how a website is explained. The most important information should be displayed readily. It should be, it should be large. It should have high contrast. It should be very easy for people to consume. Uh, and this should also flow to how information is connected with each other. So uh, you should have natural uh, hierarchy, you should have a natural category system that makes sense to people without having ever been to your website before. How do you do this uh, specifically? Let's get a little bit more tactical here. Well, your navigation should include and require as few clicks as possible. Now this goes for your main navigation, it's generally at the top of your website, sometimes it's on the, along the left side. Uh, you should have as few clicks to get to a vehicle, especially in our cases, because that's what we're trying to sell here. You should have as few clicks as possible. Uh, and really be diligent about that, really cutting that number down as, as much as possible. Um, this is one of the things that Google succeeded with their own website very early on, that in order to make a search on Google, uh, they, were, they were kind of new when, when Google was still new, they were unique in that it only took you one button. You either click, uh, I feel lucky, which would take you directly to the first result, or you click search, which would take you to 10 different blue results. Uh, 
that same idea while while updated to the modern world still applies. That you need to make sure that you can get to car pages and you get the information that applies to you as quickly as possible. The next one is categories. So use categories, not tags for navigation. Now I want to be clear with this. Categories classically defined means that you can only have one category per item of content, whereas tags differ because you can have multiple tags per item of content. In the WordPress world and in a few other worlds, this is actually not the case. Um, you can have multiple categories, you can have multiple tags, and that actually kind of skews the definitions and makes life kind of confusing. But the way that I look at it is still in the traditional way. Use categories to explain your vehicles and uh, your, your um, inventory rather than using, using tags from a clicking point of view. Now, uh, again, because it's a little confusing, I want to make sure I, that I make this as clear as possible. I'm not saying don't use categories or tags within something like WordPress. Instead, what I'm saying is make sure that your information hierarchy, that your navigation, is organized in a way similar to classically defined categories as opposed to tags, uh, meaning multiple, uh, many-to-many, as opposed to a one-to-one -one relationship, which is more, or one-to-many relationship, which sort of category be. I bet you I'm going to get some questions about that at the end because, uh, frankly, I could probably <laughs> probably could have explained that one better. The last one is uh, think like Egyptians. Build pyramids, right? And I guess this would only apply to ancient Egyptians. Uh, your website, from a whole holistic level, when looking at it, should look like a pyramid. You should have a home page at the top, which you are showing through your information hierarchy is the most important page. That's where most of the links point at. That's where uh, your most important call to actions are going to be. That's what you're going to share with your friends. Your homepage should be at the top, and then very slowly, it should get wider and wider and wider as it goes down. Uh, you do this again through the use of category systems. So, think of your website like a pyramid with the homepage at the top and everything below that, uh, and keep it as few clicks as humanly possible. All right, number four. Actively fight duplicate content. This doesn't just say avoid duplicate content or uh, be uncomfortable with duplicate content or passively aggressively view duplicate content says actively fight. Uh, duplicate content is by far the most common SEO problem. Here's what happens. You have two pages that are either identical or almost identical and they are shown to search engines. Search engines come across them and they have no idea which one is the most important version. Uh, a common example of this is when you write a blog post and then another website takes your blog post and puts it on their own blog um, so that all the content is identical. So when a search engine comes across this case, it's forced to guess which one they think is the most important case. And this is a bad situation for a marketer. We don't like when computers guess because computers are not very good at guessing, or at least many times they're not very good at guessing. <laughs> Netflix and its horrible recommendation engine is a great example of this, at least in my life. What we want to do is we want to give them clues. We want to give them signals of which, which content is most important. So in order to do this, well, how do you do this? Let's move on to number five. Number five, use best practice content management systems. Now, if you have a very tiny website, meaning say five pages or less, then you can do it yourself. But for everyone else, and this is the vast majority of internet users, you should use some kind of content management system. For my, for my purposes and for our purposes at Dealer Inspire, above and beyond and without any kind of doubt, WordPress is the best option. Now, WordPress was traditionally built for blogs, but that was many, many years ago. Now it serves many, many purposes uh, beyond that. The biggest benefit of WordPress is twofold. One, it's open source, which means that anybody can change its source code, anybody can even test it, anybody can add security fixes, anyone can try to introduce a bug, but you have an entire community, and this is the second part of this, why it's so great, so you have an entire community of people all around the world who are working on WordPress all the time, making it better, fixing bugs, adding new functionality, uh, and they work effectively for free, free for us. So when you download a plugin, so a little bit of their code, Almost always you can get that for free. So we have some of the brightest people in the whole world, some of the best developers, who are creating the latest and greatest features things they see all over the internet and all over the real world. They're putting it into one system, WordPress, which is also offered for free, uh, and they're continually innovating on this. So WordPress, I'm a huge fan on. We can go in uh, at the end of this and ask specific questions about that and why, why I like it so much. But generally, generally speaking, and if I get straight to the point, here with WordPress, it's because I know there are a whole lot of smarter people than myself here on this planet, and if they can do work for me, that makes my life a lot easier, and that's exactly what's happening with WordPress, and it doesn't cost me a dime. Let's move on to number six. Uh, number six, optimize URL structure. 
Now, we're getting into the specifics here. Uh, as we get more specific, we also get more nerdy. Uh, that's, that's just a, a trend that you're probably going to see a lot here with Dealer Inspire and our crew here. So optimize URL structure, what does this mean? Well, this refers to the big long list of address characters that you see at the top of your browser usually. So at this case, it might be app.gotomeeting.com. What we're referring to here is making sure that this is not just written for, for robots. Uh, many, many times, uh, URLs, because they're, um, because they're primarily used by computers, are written only for computers. And this is a big problem. Uh, in fact, a, a, common, a common example of this and something that uh, we see far too often is that when you're looking up uh, new pieces of inventory or when you're looking up uh, very specific items within a database, you use what's called a unique identifier. And it's essentially what it is, it's gobbledygook. It's something that will be unique once within a database and it will not ever have any chance of being duplicated elsewhere. Uh, this is great for computers because they don't care if something's gobbledygook or not. To computers, nothing makes sense. <laughs> and so everything... Anything that's unique is something that can serve. Unfortunately, it does not work the same way for computers. And actually, as I look at the URL uh, of this meeting ID, this is exactly what's happening here. We have app.gotomeeting.com slash meeting ID equals 7692721157. That was four computers by computers. And this is a poor way of doing URLs. Shame on you, go to meeting. A better way to do this is something that we do with DI and something that I highly recommend all of you do is make your URLs human readable. And you do this for several reasons. First reason is that it makes these things much more shareable. Right now, someone's very unlikely to click on this link if I share on it, if, the, if I don't explain exactly what it is. But if this link to our go-to meeting here had a human readable URL, then they would have some idea that, hey, it's this Danny guy and he's talking about some SEO stuff, and then that is gonna be much more relevant to them than just to know a series of numbers. So going way out of your way to do uh, easily human readable URLs. And actually, a nice thing about WordPress is they made this very, very simple. They know this is a very common problem, uh, and so there's like two options that you can check that'll fix this problem for you. So you stop using IDs and you start using human-readable and unique identifiers. The third part of this is pick one pattern and stick to it. Now, this is one of the most common problems I see with new websites is that you're going to have various versions of their website and their URLs on the website. So a, a common example of this is HTTP versus HTTPS. Now, HTTPS is the secure version of this, which I'm generally more for, but it is, um, it is traditionally a little bit more expensive and uh, server intensive. So um, uh, I usually, for the purposes of dealer websites, go with HTTP unless it's a sensitive thing like a credit app, in which case we most definitely go with the secure version of that. One side note on HTTPS before I go a little bit further with, uh, with these patterns is that it looks like in July of this year, technology is going to come out uh, that is going to make HTTPS uh, a two-click operation for developers, and they're going to make it free. So my guess is starting around July of this year, uh, the biggest non-necessarily secure websites are going to start using this, and then over the course of the following year, we're going to see uh, most websites start to use this. And so when I say most, I mean over 60%. Over the next two years, I think we're going to get closer to 80 and 90%. So. It's not so important for you to understand the technology behind HTTPS, but it's important to know that it, it, it means that everything on your website is encrypted so that nobody who's sitting and listening to your Wi-Fi, say at Starbucks, is going to be able to know what you're looking at, uh, which is better for privacy for both users and it's better for you as a business owner because it takes a lot of liability off of you. Okay, a little tangent there. Um, the second part of this is www versus non-www. This is something that is not, the, the feature that it is supporting is not something that's widely used anymore. So it is just a relic of something that used to be important. Uh, unfortunately, it's a very common mistake. What happens is if you have both of these versions of your website available, so if your website is example.com and it's available at both www.example.com and just example.com, then you're going to have two versions of your whole website, every single page on it and all of your content, which means you're going to run into this duplicate content problem that I talked about before. So picking one of those, writing the redirect that's required, uh, to make sure that you only have one version accessible and then just sticking to that. Numero siete? Seven? Siete? I'm going to go with that. Alt text. Include alt text for your images. Alt text is the text that is shown when a human reader or computer can't, visual, can't visualize or understand a graphic image. Now, this may seem like a subcase, but it turns out to actually happen more often than when normal humans are reading your your content. And this is because computers read your content many more times, specifically bots do, than human readers do in almost every case. So alt text is a tool for showing some kind of text uh, in the place of uh, an image. So as you know, computers can't 
generally understand an image the same way humans can, so if you can describe it, that's going to make their job of trying to understand and rank your content much, much easier. Uh, the second part of this is um, that it provides a clue of the meaning of the image. Now, this gets into crazy artificial intelligence nerd land, but the, <laughs> the general idea here is that the more clues that a search engine has about your website and its content, the more likely it is to rank it for something that is, is, is relevant. So if you're hyper-relevant for something and it happens to be the meaning of your image, then you are going to be in a really, really great spot because it's going to help you rank really high. Uh, hey, Shawnee, could you mute your microphone? I'm getting a little bit of feedback there. Um, yeah, I'm on mute, so let me check. I'm, I'm going through. Everybody's pretty much muted, so I don't know where that's coming from. Let me double check. Uh, just a reminder, everyone, if you, if you could mute your phones, that would be great if you haven't already. Thanks. Well, for the sake of time, let's continue going forward. And I'm more than happy to talk over it. Uh, let's go to number eight, please. Next slide. Include XML site maps. Now we've gotten highly technical, highly nerdy. An XML site map is a file on your website that is only for search engines. It's actually very difficult for humans to read uh, because it's been it's been created solely for the purposes of search engines. Uh, finding and organizing your content. So an XML site map is a document you can create for free. It's something that you can host. Uh, they're generally um, not too terribly big in size, so it's not something you have to worry about from a server or resource file. Most certainly your videos will be bigger than the sizes of your XML site maps. Uh, search engines need this information because while they can get lots of different data points about what URLs exist on your website, the best source of information to get of the content on your website is from you. So an XML sitemap needs to have the following things. It needs to be prioritized, which means you tell the search engines which pages are the most important. So it's obvious for them to understand your homepage is important, especially if you follow the pyramid uh, pattern that we discussed earlier. But if you have a key piece of content or a key vehicle, this is the perfect place to indicate to the search engine this is something I find to be more very, very important. Now, the search engines are free to use that information however they want. It can just be a clue, or they can take that as uh, said law but uh, at least you're giving them the option, uh, and that's the most you have control over. The next thing on here is it should be com comprehensive, so make sure that you include all of your content. Uh, now, this will be your URLs for all of your web, for all of the uh, web pages you have, but this should also include all of your videos, certainly, and then perhaps all of your images, uh, only if your images are important. Remember, each, each URL should pay its own rent. Uh, you probably shouldn't have URLs on there and images on there that aren't that you're not using anyway. So, but you want to make sure that your XML sitemaps are comprehensive. The last one is this should be updated regularly. Now, this is hard to do unless it's automated. <laughs> so, I highly recommend that you have um, they have this built in. WordPress does not have this built in by default, but you can get certain plugins, specifically Yoast SEO plugin, which will do this for you automatically. All right, let's move forward. And I believe this is the last one. Let's see how, how good I, we'll all know if I'm good at remembering things or not if we get to the next slide. Number nine, include the latest scheme and data. So this is, um, this is some super interesting uh, formats that have come out and been agreed upon by all of the major search engines and some other data companies. Essentially what you're doing is you're annotating the information you put on your website. So let's say it's the price of your car. What you're telling them in very specific terms that are meant just for robots is you're saying that this price is in US dollars and that this is referring to a new vehicle as opposed to a used vehicle. And this is referring to this text here, is referring to the, say, um, the make of the car, this one's referring to the model. What you're doing is you're explaining to computers as if they were toddlers what each of the pieces of information that you have on your website actually mean. And this means that they can then understand that better and present it in different ways. So the most obvious way for them to present this is in search results. But I think the things that will become increasingly more important as we move forward with technology is showing it in different uh, formats. So the Apple Watch, I was actually just talking to uh, Joe Chura, CEO, about this. The Apple Watch does not have a web browser built into it. Instead, it pulls in different information from sources like uh, APIs and uh, different sources of schema data. So they may not, it, it does not have a web browser, it can't, it can't view your website, but it can still extract using, if you have schema data, it can still extract information about the price of your car, the model, the make, the year, all this kind of thing, as long as you provided it to it. So people who are using these newer devices are going to still have access to that, whereas everyone who has not implemented schema, is, they are not going to have access to that. 
the one that's most relevant in this case is the auto dealer. Uh, and you can see all the information you need about that here at schema.org slash auto dealer. Okay, so then how is mere human supposed to do all of this? I mean, this is a hard thing, and this is what we as a team ran into. We were trying to do SEO on a bunch of client sites. This was our sister company launched digital marketing. We were trying to figure out um, how do we do all these SEO best practices, just understanding them and following up them is hard enough, but the platforms that are available at that time were holding us back. We'd have to file a ticket, and it'd take us two weeks to change something as simple as a title tag, and it drove us nuts. So really, out of necessity, we created um, what eventually became Dealer Inspire, the platform that we use now and that this webinar is about. Uh, we created that so that this thing, these things could be as simple as possible. Uh, so moving forward a little bit. The big surprise of this presentation, this is the big unveiling, is that Dealer Inspire does all those best practices that I mentioned automatically. And I think that's extremely exciting. I think that that's something that is revolutionary as far as my work goes. Uh, now, I want to define exactly what, on it, what, what I mean by all of this, but this is, a, this is an important part here, that all of the best practices, and, and quite frankly, I would have listed those as the best practices even if DI didn't do these things, uh, but these are things that you have to put very little effort, if any, any more into do if you use a platform like Deal Inspire. So let me talk a little bit about what I mean automatically. Now, it really does mean automatically, meaning you don't have to do anything, but with, <laughs> with anything complicated like SEO, you cannot completely automate it. So behind the scenes, this is what's going on. We have machines who are doing a big bulk of it, but we also have a staff. We have a staff that's going through and doing the things that we don't feel comfortable or that we don't think are best served by automating with machines. So we have a QC team. Hi, Katie. She's in charge of our QC team there. They're going through, and they're, <laughs> they're real people using real devices to go through and view your websites. Uh, so when we say automatic, it's certainly automatic on your side, but I want to make it clear that it's not fully automated by computers because we know computers have big flaws and big bugs and all these problems. So what we do is we have a whole staff of real people who go through and make sure that these things are done right the first time and, more importantly, as things change, go back with fresh eyes and make sure that they're continuing to conform to what the best practice is at, uh, at a given time. Move me forward a little bit, Shani. So. And if you want to get more information about this, you can check us more out at dealerinspire.com. Uh, I want to make one more point before we finish up here and get to, to the questions, so I appreciate your patience there. But as SEO, as SEO practices shift, and trust me, SEO practices shift all the time, uh, what we do at Dealer Inspire is we update our platform. And in fact, this happens uh, on a daily basis. We're adding new things, we're reading new research, we're performing a B test to figure out what works best so that we know that all the people who are using us, and this includes our own websites, are going to constantly be uh, in front of the curve, and we're going to be making sure that the latest and greatest information is used to serve this so that we can help not just computers and search engines, which is helpful, but more importantly, people who, real human beings who are out there in the world trying to buy cars. That's our focus. That's been the focus since day one, and that's something that is not going to change for us as a business. Okay, with all of that said, thanks for listening to me blabber on. Let's get into some questions here. Johnny, if you haven't unmuted your mic, now would be an optimal time to do so. Yeah, I want to just see um, if you would like to. Um, I kind of have everyone muted, so you can either send me a, um, you know, send it to the chat, and I'll speak it out for you, or I don't know. I'll, yeah, oh, okay. All right, here we go. Um, so Drew Nelson is asking, what about link building or deep linking strategies? Ah, wonderful question. So a major part of SEO, uh, in fact, perhaps the most important part, is link building. Now, this is something that is extremely hard to scale, something that um, most of the automated and outsourced efforts on this have been um, exactly what has worked, what worked against people when they, when they ran into the Penguin and Panda update. So uh, we purposely do not try to come up with subpar solutions to this. Uh, instead, we focus on creating the websites and making the content the best we can, and then using social to help promote those and build links naturally. So all the link building that we do is completely natural uh, and is really focused on the content first and the link second. Okay. Um, anyone else? Don't be shy. Evans, you, this is your, it's a chance to get to know everything you ever want to know about uh, SEO and how search engines think and how to get rich content on your site. Okay. Well, um, you know what, Danny? Uh, 
where, oh, Drew's got another question for you. Uh, do you recommend linking blog posts to Facebook and face, Facebook posts to the blog? Oh, good question. Okay, so let me go through and talk a little bit about some of the social strategies that we've been using. So while SEO still, and I want to reiterate this point, while SEO is still our most important and best performing channel, we've seen a large rise in social. So this has been in Facebook and in Twitter and in all those other social networks that you're familiar with. So let me talk a little bit about, and Drew, I want to directly address your question here, about some of the strategies we have around that. So what social media is really, really good at is building audiences, building communities of fans, uh, and then continually enabling us to provide uh, content to them. So it's usually blog posts, but many times it's other kinds of things. So what is our, our tactic specifically for the linking strategy? Well, what we do is we create one URL, generally a, a blog post, or at least in this example, a blog post, and we use it as the hub. That's the one canonical source that we're going to send everyone to. And then we take this and we put this throughout all of our other social channels. So Facebook's one of these. Uh, Twitter's one of these. If it's appropriate, we would do Snapchat or we do Pinterest or we do um, uh, Periscope or whatever, whatever maybe. So we only link it one way, Drew. That's the direct answer to your question. Uh, it goes from the many social networks, which is a many, to uh, one place. Uh, so it's only a one-way link. Now, from a strict SEO perspective, you could do a two-way link, uh, but uh, and you, and you probably wouldn't lose like the SEO benefit because it's a reciprocal link but it's just not effective for humans. It doesn't really make sense. Uh, they don't want to click on a Facebook link, go to a blog post only to be shown a link going back to the Facebook page where they were just at. Instead, the only the exception we make to that is we will link to our social uh, like landing pages, so the, the Twitter account or the Facebook page. Those will be in the places you'd expect them on a website, usually in the top right uh, or at the bottom of blog posts, but we, we certainly don't go out of our way to do reciprocal links between any given blog post and any given social share. All right, great, thanks. Hopefully yeah. that answers your question, Andrew. Um, uh, we have another question here from um, Alexandra. She wants to know, uh, Drew said, yes, it did, thanks. Um, Alexandra wants to know, what are your thoughts about the new mobile algorithm that Google is releasing uh, next month? I was hoping someone's gonna bring that up. Thanks, Alexandra. Okay. So there is a new uh, algorithm coming out, uh, supposedly April 1st, which is uh, you know, like a few days from now. Uh, and what Google is saying is this is going to have more reach than, um, and by reach they mean affected queries, than both Panda and Penguin combined. And again, as a reminder, those were the two biggest algorithms that we've seen to date. So this is supposed to be a very, very large one. Now, there are, there's some caveats to this, and, and this actually reveals what my thoughts are on this upcoming algorithm. First of all, it only affects uh, uh, mobile queries, so so uh, searches that are made on a mobile device. And this can include uh, cell phones, but it's also tablets. It can also be kind of other devices, like a, say an Apple TV, I think also is included in that. So it only affects those devices. Now, for <laughs> the, the nerds myself, like myself, you're going to realize that that's about 50% of queries. And of those queries, many of them will be affected. What it looks like, though, is that this this algorithm update is going to mainly affect websites that do not have mobile-friendly versions. So the use case for this is someone's on a mobile device and they search for something. Uh, their query is, if it's affected by this algorithm, is going to show the results are going to show more mobile-friendly websites than they are going to show non-mobile web, uh, friendly websites. With uh, Dealer Inspire, this is not something that we will worry about in, in the least bit. Uh, because all of our websites from day one are mobile friendly. We use something called responsive design. So while we do not believe this is going to uh, affect any of our websites, uh, we're certainly going to be keeping tabs on it and we're working with people as this as this rolls out and as we see the reaction. But uh, it's not something that I've been losing sleep over, although it's something I've read a whole lot about just to make sure that we're prepared. And with anyone who's using responsive design, uh, you will be totally fine for this. All right. Um, ben is just asking another really good question here. Okay. So uh, it's kind of like a two-part, two-part. So what are the best practices for image alt tags? And I think the example, and Ben, you can let me know if I'm hitting this, um, is uh, do you use an example? Do you use, for instance, just a, the uh, basically the date of the car? So like 2015 Chevy Tahoe, or do you use something a little more um, semantic, a little more uh, human relatable, like happy couple with finance guy. Hmm. And then there's All a, right, there's a, a second question. point for that if you ask it. Uh, so first off, uh, 
as far as the best practices with the alt text. Now, technically speaking, there is an upper limit on the amount of characters that you can use for alt text. So you'll have to look that up because it's something like 10,000 characters. It's a limit I've never reached before, but it is worth pointing out that technically speaking, there is an upper limit to the amount of characters that can be used. From a best practice day-to-day -day perspective, what I try to do is keep this as short as possible while keeping it descriptive. So Ben, to answer your question directly, what I try to do is I try to find a happy medium between uh, describing what the image actually is and what it's meaning and relating to keywords that I'm trying to target on a page. So I would certainly include the, say, 2015 um, Honda Civic, but I would also include things that are relevant uh, for people searching and looking for that kind of a result. So I'd include the color. I would include, if it's new or used, I'd include information that I think is going to be helpful for human beings. Uh, so I'm focusing on keeping it short while keeping it descriptive and serving as itself a search result. And would you add the uh, would you add the location to the alt tag? That's a good question. So I would only add the location of the alt tag if I thought it was relevant to the image that I was showing the alt text for. So okay. if it's a picture of a city or if it's a picture more likely of a car in a city, I may identify what that city is and hopefully if, uh, if you're doing smart local SEO tactics, it's going to be the city that you're trying to target or it's going to be the skyline of the city you're trying to target. So in those cases where I think it's relevant, uh, again, where it would, it would make sense as its own independent search result, I do include it in those cases, but not uh, when it when it seems out of context. All right. All right. Great. Thank you. Great answer. Okay. Um, yeah, I think. All right. So, you know what, Danny, is there, um, I know that you have, uh, you can find you almost anywhere. I mean, really just uh, Google Danny, Do Danny Dover and, um, you know, I could hear uh, all about the everything that he has to do. I mean, there's so much more than just, um, you know, SEO. So I know you personally, but also, um, you know, he's just a really great guy. Check out his lifelisted.com. Uh, check out his book. His book is absolutely amazing. Um, and, uh, yeah, is there any other way that we can reach you other than travel along with you and go places? Uh, yep, you can certainly find me on social networks, so at Danny Dover for most of them. Uh, and then keep an eye out on the launch, uh, launch digital marketing blog. That's where a lot of good information is coming out, and where you'll you'll see a lot of uh, a lot of insight on some of our team members and what we're doing behind the scenes and what we're the kind of stuff that we're thinking about. Oh yeah, yes, we are. Um, we are going to be sending out soon. I'll probably get in trouble for saying this, but uh, yeah, we're going to be launching some uh, some major marketing videos um, touching on just about everything you need to know about what we're doing there, launch and dealer inspire, and um, they. Uh, they're amazing. So thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Danny. It's a pleasure. More than happy to do it. All right, thanks. So um, if you guys need have any other questions or anything, please uh, do not hesitate to contact um, and contact me at DAI How Do I at uh, dealerinspire.com, and I will, um, you know, forward any kind of questions or any kind of uh, comments that you had on. Uh, you can also contact um, Danny, and feel free to give us contact Dealer Inspire, sales at dealerspire.com. Um, and please stay tuned for the next webinar. Uh, we're going to talk about our de design philosophy, which really plays a huge part um, in a lot of what we just talked about today and in every other aspect of what we do. You know, it plays a huge part in the, you know, in, in making sure that the, everything is search engine optimized and that Google, you know, knows what the do with your information and that it's user friendly. I mean, that's the biggest thing, right? So next week, we're going to be talking about our design philosophy and how all this plays together. That'll be with Noah Aird, our lead designer. So again, thank you, everyone. Um, I am Shawnee. I am the trainer of technologies for innovative dealers such as yourself. And we'll see you guys next week. Thanks, Danny. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Hot air rises and my face gets hot, either cold.